Morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church in Gainesville, Florida. We are glad you're here and we are expectant. We are expectant that we are gathered together as a community of God. We, are, we expect God to show up. We expect God to have a message for us today. Uh, we, as usual, we are gathered in three, the three different ways that we gather on Sunday morning. We have people live right here in our sanctuary. We have people that are joining us remotely, both over the internet and um, the television. And we are glad that all of us are together today to uh, hear what God has for us. As you came through the door, I hope you got a copy of our worship guide. It will give you a general flow to what's going on uh, with our worship service, but also it helps empower you to move from the point of just being a, an observer of worship to being a participant in worship. Worship is something that we are called to participate in. It's not like a movie, not like a play. You just sit there and watch, maybe clap every once in a while. Uh, this is something that you are involved in, you are invited in, and the worship guide helps us. Uh, you can get it uh, either way that you came in. If you forgot to grab one, you can do that. Or you can get the attention of one of the ushers in the back or one of our staff that will help you out for sure. For those of you that are joining us remotely, if you go to our website and scroll down, you'll see that there are two options. Uh, one for those of you that are joining us on television and one for those of you that are joining us on YouTube. And you can either look at it or print it out, whatever works out for you, whatever you find the most helpful. On the back of our announcements, uh, we have, back of our worship guide, we have several announcements. I'm going to highlight just a few of those as we get started, but please read through them all so you know what's going on in the life of your church. Today, we are returning to a tradition that, we, that this church has had for a long time, the Keter Lecture Series, and I'm going to say more about that, but we are really uh, excited that uh, we get to walk back into this tradition that has meant so much in the life of our church. The third Love in Action concert will be held during the 11 a.m. worship service next Sunday. There will not be an 8.30 a.m. worship service. In preparation, the local missions committee is asking you to join our Love in Action challenge, to participate in at least one activity to share God's love with those in need in our community. And they uh, gave us an insert that has uh, some options and opportunities on it. These are meant to be things that just spark things in you that uh, this is what I need to do. Uh, you may look at that and go, you know, that one, number three, is exactly what I need to do. But it also may remind you of something else that's not listed on here that is the thing that you need to do right now. So think about as we go into this Love in Action Sunday that we have next week, how can you do something to spark your activity, your action to help those in need. Our local missions committee is also inviting us to lunch with Eric Davis, the director of housing at St. Francis House, on Thursday, April 18th at noon here in Gordon Hall. He will discuss the issue of homelessness and affordable housing in Gainesville and the mission of St. Francis House to help. Please RSVP by Tuesday, April 16th to the church office if you'd like to be involved in that. And then also our churchwide fellowship and Lake Day is Saturday, April 27th at Camp Montgomery Center from 10 a.m. to 5. The cost is $10 per person or $35 max per family. Please RSVP by Sunday, April 14th to Bev Valudman and her contact information is in your worship guide. As I said, uh, today we welcome the return of our Keter Lecture Series. The Keter Lecture is an endowed lecture designed to empower and enlighten the church. This year's Keter Lecturer is Michael Ware, the founder, president, and CEO of the Center for Christianity and Public Life, a nonpartisan institution based in the nation's capital with a mission to contend for the credibility of Christian resources in public life for the public good. For well over a decade, he's served as a trusted resource and advisor for a range of civic leaders on matters of faith and public life. He believes that the spiritual health and civic character of individuals is deeply tied to the state of our politics and public affairs. 
Michael and his wife, Melissa, are both proud natives of Buffalo, New York, and now reside in Maryland with their two daughters. And one of his daughters is with him uh, today. Um, she's heard him twice, though, and thought she would sit this one out. Um, also, I explained, you know, whenever we have a guest speaker or something like this, I think it's important to explain us to them so they can kind of understand stuff. And when I heard he was from Buffalo, New York, I knew he was a Bills fan and knew that I had to explain to him that this church takes football, especially college football, very serious. And so someone would probably be pulling him aside today and say, I want to talk about the Diggs trade um, that happened this week if you're a, a, a football, an NFL football fan. So um, he said he was tempted to make his message entirely about that, but he's kind of gone a different way. So anyway, um, what has been fun about sponsoring this is uh, I knew when I got here, I knew if this church was healthy that one of the things that it would be involved with is, bo is being a part of the community of the University of Florida. Um, we want to be involved in what is going on at the University of Florida. We want to be influencers. We want to be influenced. We want things to happen really well. And I was really excited to see that, that that spirit is really here. And in bringing Michael today, um, it's not just an act of our church. Uh, we have partnered with the Christian Studies Center, which is a uh, ministry on campus, and their director, Mike's, I, Mike, I always freak out on your name, Mike Saka, Saka, I can't do it right. Say, say it again? Sakasis. I got it right in first service and I'm blowing it now. But anyway, um, I asked Mike to come up for a minute and talk about the Christian Study Center and why uh, this makes sense in their ministry uh, to be involved in what we're doing today. Thank you, Mike. If it's any consolation, Mark, I've heard much worse. Um, it's good to be here, and it's good to be here amongst friends. I know members of this congregation have served on our board, have been active members in our program, whether it's reading groups or lectures, uh, have been supporters, and so we're grateful. Uh, on behalf of the Christian Studies Center, we'd also like to thank the congregation for, for your support of our work. Uh, we've been in the university community for approaching 25 years. Uh, and I've uh, been glad to get to know Mark over the past several months uh, and to think about what it might mean to partner with you in bringing Michael Ware to campus, and we're glad to be able to do that. It certainly fits in uh, with our vision for our place in the university community, serving obviously graduate, undergraduate students, also faculty, whether they be Christian faculty or otherwise, uh, but the larger community, including the church community. Uh, it is a, a natural endeavor for us to as we seek Christian formation in the university community to come alongside of churches that are seeking the same thing uh, and work together where that makes uh, a lot of sense as it does in this Keter Lecture Series. So it's our honor to be partnering with you to bring uh, Michael Ware here. Um, I will say just a brief word about what we do and, and I'll steal a line from uh, the way that Michael describes the work of the Center for Christianity and Public Life in saying that the mission is to contend for the credibility of Christian resources in public life and I would say that very, very much is what we're after, to contend for the credibility of Christian resources in academic life, uh, to be a place where the Christian intellectual tradition is embodied, where students who may come struggling with questions about their faith that they are now encountering in a university classroom, or those who maybe don't have any experience with the Christian faith, but are curious and are interested to learn about what Christianity has to say about the meaning of life and the meaning of, of personhood and about the nature of reality, that they can come and be enriched and have meaningful conversations, have those questions addressed in a way uh, that is honest and affirming and does not shy away from the, the intellectual challenges that we face. Uh, we re have reading groups where we seek to bring text to bear upon those questions. Uh, we have classes where we tackle those questions directly. Uh, and then we bring speakers to town, like Michael, that uh, we have here today, that help us think through these questions in a meaningful way and, again, to embody the Christian faith in the context, whether it's politics or any of the disciplines that the university seeks to address. Um, and so this is very much in, in keeping with the spirit of what we're after. And we're, again, grateful for your support. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any more questions you might have about the center. You can find me after the service and also visit our website. Uh, and you can sign up for our updates and find out more about what we have going on a little bit throughout the summer and then as we ramp up again in the fall. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. 
Joe's right, we have a wonderful coffee shop. But I just assume nobody needs to know about that. Uh, it is the best coffee shop in town and a great place for students uh, to meet and also for ministry leaders to meet. Uh, and one of the chief ways in which we show our hospitality to the university community. Thank you for the plug, Joe. Me? Oh. I'm sorry. I'm confused. If you're able, we invite you to join us in standing for our call to worship. Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. It is life.
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Join us in our corporate prayer, followed by a time of silent, personal reflection. Please join me. Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the one true Lord and Savior. Our allegiance should be with you unequivocally, but we both know that isn't so. When we feel threatened, we demonstrate our idolatry by conflicting with others. Bless those we have wounded, family, friends, and fellow church members in our attempts to gain control. Forgive us, Lord. Lead us back to where we demonstrate our hope really is in you. Now, O oh Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence. We have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, who offered His life in love to save the world from sin. Friends, believe the good news of the Gospel. Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 22, verse 25 to 31, which can be found on Old Testament page 501 in your pew Bibles. And now, let us prepare our hearts for the reading of God's Word with the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. God of all who doubt and believe, by the gift of your Spirit, enable us to hear with our ears, to see with our eyes, and to touch with our hands your word of life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, in whose name we pray. Amen. Psalm 22, verse 25 to 31. Please hear the word of the Lord. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord.
I would like to invite our other young disciples forward for a time just for them. And I'd like to invite Sarah Whitfield forward, who's going to lead that time. Good morning, good morning. All right, good morning. Oh, we have a really good group here today. Um, now, I wanted to ask, have you guys ever seen a magic trick? Okay, all right, we've seen some magic tricks. Have you guys seen some magic tricks? All right, so I'm gonna bring up a volunteer. Will you be my volunteer? Now, she and I, we're going to have to confer really quick, so I'm going to turn this off so you guys can't hear me. All right, so we're prepared. My assistant is ready now. Everybody's going to have to concentrate really hard on this, and in just a minute, I'm actually going to make her completely disappear, and I can even bring her back at least 50% of the time. So, now, for this to work, you're going to have to close your eyes really quick. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. We've got to really concentrate. We've got to really concentrate. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. Your eyes better be closed, and in three, two, one. <gasps> she's gone oh my gosh it worked it's the first time it's worked okay all right now I'm gonna count three two and I'll see if she comes back okay in three two one she's gonna reappear somewhere oh <gasps> there she is she just reappeared somewhere completely different that was amazing thank you so much for all your help you were an excellent assistant Lucy all right. You want to disappear too? Okay. <laughs> We're going to see if it works twice. All right. Well, one more time. Okay. Three, two, one, and go. It worked again. I'm getting pretty good at this. I'm going to take, I'm going to take this on the road. Okay. Now, in, in, we're going to see, this is again the 50% where I'm not sure if this one will reappear. So in, she's going to reappear in three, two, one. She's going to come back from somewhere. Well, 50% of the time it works. So anyway, that being said. <gasps> Yay! All right. Now that is actually, that's all the time I have for magic today, but we'll do more magic another day. Now, in the Bible, we're going to read this story in just a minute. In the Bible, there was a magician, and his name was Simon. And he was probably not as good a magician as me, but maybe. Um, and he did all sorts of cool things, and people thought, oh, this guy is pretty good. But when Simon, the magician, saw the disciples and what they were doing, the miracles that they were doing, the way they were healing people, he saw that, and he said, that's the real deal. Now, he also then decided, you know, I kind of want to get a piece of that. Can I, can, I, can I buy that from you guys? Could you, can I pay you for those, for those magic tricks? And the disciples were like, oh, you're missing the point. Because the disciples weren't doing magic. They were doing miracles. Do you guys know, where did the disciples get their power from? What do you think? Where did they get their power Any, any guesses? Where do they get their power? From God, yes. So magic is really just tricks. It's smoke and mirrors and people running really fast for me. And it's not more than that. But miracles all came from God. Now, will you guys pray with me? Dear God, please give us the chance to also show people your power. 
so that people might believe in you. Amen. Well, it is not right to make uh, speakers follow that. Uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here now, but maybe if Sarah can come back, if you'll all close your eyes for three seconds, uh, I can uh, get out of having to follow that. <laughs> it is uh, a real joy uh, to be with you. Um, let's, let's turn to the reading for the New Testament reading for today, uh, you'll find it uh, on, let's see here, on page 126. I'm going to read from Acts 8, 9 through 24. Now, a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they listened eagerly to him, because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. After being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip, and was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I am uh, tremendously honored and uh, glad to be with you, uh, be with you today. Have had a wonderful time uh, in this community uh, up to this point. Want to thank you, uh, Pastor Mike. Want to thank really the whole congregation for your hospitality to me, my daughter Sirsha. Um, I, I, I will say. Uh, I, you all have disappointed my daughter in one significant way, though I, I can't really blame you for it. Uh, uh, on the drive over here, she said, Dada, I can't believe you're speaking to a church full of alligators. <laughs> <laughs> I, s something might have been lost in translation. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but uh, that's more of a me problem, not a, not a you problem. I need to keep in mind. Uh, <laughs> in his essay, Membership, C.S. Lewis writes, a sick society 
must think much about politics, as a sick man must think much about his digestion. However, if either comes to regard it as the natural food of the mind, if either forgets that we think of such things only in order to be, to, uh, think of, to be able to think of something else, then what was undertaken for the sake of health has become itself a new and deadly disease. Our culture and many people in our churches are sick with that new and deadly disease. Politics is causing great spiritual harm in America, and a big reason for that is that Americans, including many Christians, are going to politics to get their spiritual needs met. We cannot separate out the kind of politics we have, our laws, our political leaders and institutions, our political culture, from the kind of people we are. Our politics is doing great harm, and if that is the change, it is vital that we recognize the ways in which our politics is ours. The state of our politics is a reflection of the state of our souls. If we were a different kind of people, our politics would be different. So what kind of person are you? This is the question. Not just when it comes to politics, but when it comes to life. When it comes to life with Jesus. You are not one person in politics and another person in your personal life. You're just you. Thoughts, feelings, and actions that are characteristic for a person when they are dealing with politics are not quarantined off from the rest of the person. If you are the kind of person who lies during political arguments to get your way, you are the kind of person who lies during political arguments to get your way. If you are the kind of person who wishes ill to fall upon those you disagree with politically, you are that kind of person. Jesus cares a great deal about the kind of person you are, and he has great hope for the kind of person you are becoming. All of life is about the kind of person we are and the kind of person we are becoming. And what we see in Acts 8 are two vignettes that will be helpful to us in understanding the centrality of these questions. In Acts 8, we're told that Philip was preaching the gospel. He performed great signs. Scripture tells us he was driving out impure spirits in the name of Jesus, healing the paralyzed and the lame. But Philip came to a people who were already enamored with a man who performed signs of a different kind and from a different source. Scripture tells us, but there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria. They began to call him great. He had drawn great attention and admiration to himself. Then the apostles came, the people believed, including, interestingly, Scripture tells us Simon believed. There's a lot of debate about exactly what that, what that, what that means. And as Simon sees the, uh, the apostles uh, heal and perform miracles, and as Sarah said, he said, I, I want a piece of that. And he offers money uh, he offers money uh, in exchange. He was looking for a transaction. He thought, look, I have credibility here. People know me. I can contribute a lot to, a lot to your cause. And as we read, he gets rebuked. What did he get rebuked for? Simon wanted the power of the kingdom of God without becoming the kind of person who would be fit for the kingdom. Simon was willing to use the language of faith, but not because he had a vision for a life of faith. Instead, he saw what the apostles could do, and he wanted to do the same. Naturally, that is, out of his very nature, he sought to acquire this ability through transaction, not through personal transformation. Simon actually was not interested at all in the substance of the deed, but rather in the utility of the deed, what it could do for him. He thought that with money he could bypass actually becoming the kind of person who could do the things 
he saw the apostles do. Peter identified this and told Simon to repent, not for what he did, but for, quote, this wickedness of yours. Peter tells Simon to pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart, what you want, what you will, may be forgiven you. And Simon is so inattentive to his own heart, so unable to hear Peter's rebuke, that his plea in response makes little sense. Look at the scripture. He prays in response to the rebuke regarding the intent of his own heart. He prays that nothing that Peter said would come upon him. But Peter's rebuke was about the very nature of his heart. Simon remained under the delusion that what did or did not come upon him, what he could or could not do, was a subject that was removed from the kind of person he was. Immediately following the story of Simon and the narrative of Scripture, Philip comes across an Ethiopian eunuch, a man of significant status in charge of the treasury of the queen. And the eunuch was seeking knowledge of the things of God as well. However, the eunuch's story is quite different from that of Simon's. Scripture tells us that the Spirit told Philip to go to the eunuch's chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The eunuch responded, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And so the eunuch invites Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. The eunuch proceeds to ask Philip, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture to tell him about the good news of Jesus. Scripture continues. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch learned the substance of what he desired first and pursued it through means intrinsic to the desire itself. The eunuch caught a vision of the gospel. He clearly set an intention to give his life to it, and he took up immediately the means to do so. Vision, intention, means. And he was filled with joy. Our society, our politics, our churches are too often hampered by a technological conceit that we can attain the kind of society we seek without coming to terms with the kind of people we are and without becoming a different kind of people. But societal change, real, lasting societal change, is not possible without coming to terms with the nature of the problem. C.S. Lewis describes how thinking of politics leads quite naturally to thinking about formation. He wrote, a Christian society is not going to arrive until most of us really want it. And we are not going to want it until we become fully Christian. I may repeat, do as you would be done by till I am blue in the face, but I cannot really carry it out till I love my neighbor as myself. And I cannot learn to love my neighbor as myself till I learn to love God. And I cannot learn to love God except by learning to obey him. And so, as I warned you, we are driven on to something more inward driven, on from social matters to religious matters. Dallas Willard, a philosopher, affirms the basic point, citing T.S. Eliot who uh, uh, once described the current human endeavor as, quote, uh, he said that humans are seeking to find a system of order so perfect that people no longer have to be good. Find a system so good that we no longer have to be good. Willard responded, the way of Jesus tells us, by contrast, 
that any number of systems, not all to be sure, will work well if we are genuinely good. And we are then free to seek the better and the best. As Christians, we care about politics because we care about our neighbors and our communities. And political decisions significantly impact our neighbors' well-being. As a citizen, you do not choose to have political influence. You already have it. Therefore, sitting out of politics does not absolve you of blame for the state of our politics. Your sitting out is your choice about how to steward the responsibility you have been given. Politics is one of the essential forums in which we can love our neighbor. To love our neighbor is to will their good. This is what drives Christians to politics. We do not go to politics to seek affirmation or as a primary source of identity. Christians go to politics to affirm human dignity and advance justice. Our spiritual and emotional needs are met elsewhere. As Christians who seek to follow Jesus, we seek to do in politics what we seek to do with all of our lives. Place that which is within the range of our effective will under God's will. God's kingdom is the range of his effective will, where what God wants done is done. We each have our own little kingdoms, the range of our effective will, where what we want done is essentially done. I have a five-year-old daughter. She's very clearly not always within the range of my effective will. <laughs> That's more of a negotiation. There are <laughs> conflicting jurisdictions. <laughs> we want to place all that we have a say over under the jurisdiction of love. We want to act in the knowledge of the glory of God and in light of who God is and what he thinks about those he has made. C.S. Lewis was saying something like this when he said in his famous sermon, The Weight of Glory, that it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or other of these destinations. And it is in light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. Too often when it comes to politics, Christianity is viewed as useless or as something to be used. Too often it's Christians themselves who hold this view. But Christians will approach politics best when they do not think of politics first. And so here is my admonition, my plea, my suggestion to you. What if you, what if your family, what if this church community made a commitment that politics, as with every area of life, is a place, an arena, in which and through which for you to live out your faith? What if you made a commitment that you, your family, your church would shine as a beacon in a culture that so often seeks to place politics as either outside and irrelevant to the gospel or above and more important than the gospel? That you would view politics as falling within and under the gospel? What if you, what if this church, what if you made a commitment to one another that your political opinions run secondary to your commitments to one another? What if politics, instead of serving as the source of frustration, division, and social conflict in our lives and our churches, became a forum in which you were actively seeking to follow Paul's call in Colossians 3 to rid ourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, and instead clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience? If Paul didn't mean that for our politics, what, what did he mean it for? You see, our politics tells us rage and malice are necessary and effective. 
But we have knowledge as Christians that suggests different. And we can live it out. We can prove it with our lives. What if in the midst of a frantic public square, our churches and our families were embassies of joy, of a pervasive and constant sense of well-being? That's Dallas Willard's definition of joy. At events uh, over the last few years, I've asked audiences, how many of you would define our politics as full of a pervasive and constant sense of well-being? It's a laugh line, right? Why, why is that? Our politics tells us that it is ultimate. But the psalmist says we can be people who have no fear of bad news, whose Lord leads them beside still waters. I got a call. I got a call uh, now probably, gosh, five, five years ago from a, from a friend. My friend is a real um, political campaigner. She's not, she's, she, she works in politics. And uh, I work with my friend on um, international human rights issues. And so when she calls me, that's usually what it's about. Some petition has to get together. She wants to address some issue. Instead, she calls me and she says, Michael, um, I have a daughter in college. And uh, my daughter is no longer going to church with her family. She doesn't see how my work lines up with the values I raised her with. Now, I have my answers, my, my friend would say. And I know my friend to be seeking to live an integrated, faithful life to try and put things together. And obviously not perfect, but I, I know she has, a, she has a consistent story in her head about how her political work lines up with her faith, etc. But she said, my, my daughter just doesn't buy it. I don't know if any of you who are parents, they have kids who just don't buy what you tell them, even though you know there's a coherence to it. And she said, Michael, I was hoping you might spend some time with my daughter. I want her to spend time with a faithful, orthodox, malo, orthodox uh, Christian who just happens to have a different approach to politics than her mother. And then this is the line that got me. My, my friend said, Michael, uh, I no longer care about the future of my daughter's politics. I just want her to start going back to church with her family again. And uh, I, I would, as I've traveled around the country, I'll, I would venture that there are people in this room who are waiting for someone in their life to tell them that they care more about their walk with Jesus than about the future of their politics. There are people in this room, I would venture, who are waiting for someone to tell them that they would loosen their hold on their political ambitions, what they thought was right on politics, if it meant they might draw nearer to Jesus. I wonder if we might be the kind of people who are capable of saying, I loosen my grip on my political views, if it means that you might draw nearer to Jesus, if it means that I might draw nearer to Jesus. I want to be like the man Jesus talked about who found a treasure hidden in a field and sold everything he had to buy that field. What do you want? What are you here for? I don't want the trappings of God. I want God himself. And I want him everywhere. I want to put on the things of Christ. I want to be so full of love for God that I am free to love my neighbor, to will their good. This is what we need. This is what our politics needs. May God help us want what he wants, as he has promised and is faithful to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, 
allow the desires of our heart to be pleasing to you. Help us to become the kind of people who are learning to do what you would do if you were us. We want to follow you. In Scripture, you tell us, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my teachings. My Father will come to you, and we will love you. We will make our homes in you. Oh, Lord, make your home in us so that we, in all areas of life, in our families, in our businesses, in our workplaces, in our school, in our studies, and yes, in politics, may be putting on the things of Christ and putting away the old self with its practices and putting on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Amen. Thank you for being with us today, Michael. If I can steal a line for those parents who allowed us to have kids with us, thank you for winning the jurisdiction this morning. <laughs> to get them here, it is a blessing to have them. Uh, one of my roles at this church is to help our young adults and families, and I also work with our youth. And hearing your last story, Michael, um, it's not just, from what I've read, it's not just that we're here at church for our kids. But it's that our faith impacts every area of our life that those two things together allow the next generation to strongly consider what their faith will be like. So coming here is important, but your kids seeing you grow in your personal time with Christ speaks loudly, if not louder, than mere church attendance. So while I appreciate the fact that you made sure they were here, the value we bring to our homes as Christian parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, friends, what they see us do, how they see us live out our faith in our homes, in our businesses, how we deal with crazy people on the road or people that cut in front of you in Publix, the Christian faith we apply to our lives is what affects them in their growing decision to be Christians or not. So join us here, but also help us do what we can to make your faith walk something, as Michael said, that impacts every aspect of your life. If it doesn't, your kids see that. Every generation is smarter than the one that preceded them. Your kids are smart. Even at five, I'm sure Michael would say, his daughter is impacting him in ways that he hasn't before. Mine do, at 16 and 14, and I've almost lost all jurisdiction. <laughs> so, um, but I really hope they see me, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian, having God impact my life. So Michael, thank you so much for challenging us in the holisticness of who we are, to have our Christian faith be, a, be important and valued. Uh, if you're able, I'm going to invite you to join me in standing as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
As we take our offering now, please grab the fellowship pads that are on the inside of your pew, sign in on them, and pass them down the pew so that everyone gets a chance to sign in. Let us continue to unite our voices in worship with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.
Again, what a joy uh, to be with you. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he help you to bear one another's burdens as you love God and love your neighbor. Amen. Become part of a community that seeks to glorify God, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, and meet human needs. Join us at First Presbyterian Sundays at 8.30 and 10.55, or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9. We welcome you.